about 20 days ago, July on July 5th, A&M's uh, Letterman Association announced that uh, eight gentlemen and ladies, I should say, were uh, going to be in the new Hall of Honor, a lifetime achievement as well. Uh, and that class consists of a bunch of p- people that you know from this show and uh, beyond. And one of those is our guest today here on Tech Sags Radio. I'm just going to give you a little bit about his resume because you remember the great stuff that he did in four years at Aggieland. Part of one of the most feared pitching staffs in the nation, a two-time All-American, uh, was a NCAA wins leader in 2011, run to the College World Series. He pitched just yesterday. Ross Stripling joining us here on the Boss Firearms Hotline. Ross, thanks so much for joining us, man. Hey, howdy, man. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning to you. So just first, let me ask you about yesterday. How did yesterday go? I know you were out for a little bit. And how are you feeling coming out of yesterday's uh, win? Feel good, man. Feel good. Um you know, yeah, it's always frustrating coming back from an injury. I missed about seven weeks with a small forearm strain. So it just uh, feels good to be back out there on a big league mound, man. I needed to knock off some cobwebs at a tough second inning, but um, able to get out of it. And they let me in there to to uh, figure some stuff out. Ended up having a clean last couple innings and got a win. So, you know, actually the A's, we're playing pretty good, man. We're, we're hitting the ball really well right now. we got some young arms that are pitching where, you know, I think we've got a chance to kind of – make some noise in the second half here and maybe go into the off season, you know, feeling good about where we're at. I was going to say that over the weekend, they take care of business against the Astros. I think you've won seven of 10. So uh, po- the arrows pointing up, how are the fans handling everything with all the changes and that are upcoming? And how, how's that been? Yeah, you can tell they're frustrated, man. You know I mean? Oakland's about to lose their last um, power sport, right? I mean, the Raiders have left the, uh, the Warriors are now over in San Francisco proper and we're going, you know, Sacramento on our way to Las Vegas. So you can tell they're frustrated. They don't really take it out on us, which we appreciate. They know it's not our fault. And at the end of the day, we're just a bunch of, you know, I'm the oldest guy on the team. we got a bunch of kids that are kind of in the big leagues for the first, maybe second year. So they're, they're just trying to get their careers going, trying to play big league baseball and trying to kind of wipe out the noise a little bit so the fans i think understand that but you know every game has a sell the team chant um you know if you follow on twitter and stuff like that you certainly see plenty of it and fans that are uh, upset with the situation but um you know luckily they're not taking out on us they're letting us just play baseball that is so weird to hear you say that you're the oldest guy on the team because for those of us who watched you pitch it felt like yesterday but you are one of the team leaders right yeah, that's been fun, man. That's That's been a new role that I really haven't had. You know, I was really lucky to have guys like Chase Utley, Clayton Kershaw, Justin Turner when I was young with the Dodgers uh, really lead the way and kind of show me how to do it. And I'm doing the Clayton Kershaw method over here, which is really lead by example. I'm, I'm vocal when I have to be, and I, I've certainly made myself available to any young player that wants to pick my brain or ask me a question or, or whatever, but, um, you know, really just kind of going about my business and trying to to lead the kids by example. And, and um, you know, it's, it's hard to do when you miss seven weeks with an injury, but at least uh, still around the team and able to help out where I can. So that's that's been a fun role, something I've never really had to do before. Kershaw still claims A&M, doesn't he? Uh, sort of. His wife's an Aggie, so he kind of, she makes him do it, I, and I make him do it too. Uh, I think he knew all along he was never coming here, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make him be an Aggie for as long as I can. How about the uh, Hall of Fame honor? How cool was that to find out? Man, really is so special. Uh, my grandfather was a head yell leader back in the 40s. I believe he buried the first Reveille right outside of Cal Field before she was even a collie. I think she was some kind of lab back then. Yeah, um, and then my dad was at A and M in the seventies. Uh, my brother is older than me. He was at A and M. You know, I I, I foregone basically. I I I had essentially quit baseball. I didn't want to go play junior college, and uh, I wanted to be an Aggie. And I was able to convince Rob Childress to let me walk on, and he was the one that ends up calling me to say that I I made the Hall of Fame a couple weeks ago. So kind of full circle and how special that was. But, you know, really just I'm an Aggie through and through, man. I still live an hour down the road in Houston, come to as many games and and come to College Station as much as I can. I have two sons that I certainly are going to push to Aggie land as hard as I can. So, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, to have the Stripling name enshrined anywhere in Aggie land is, is pretty special. So something I'm definitely very proud of. Ross, I want to follow that that journey here, too, because I think it's such a cool story for for kids who maybe when they're 18, 19, 20, they're, they haven't really realized their full potential that if you stay with your dream, look, you're s- still in the big leagues. Like talk a little bit about that, like staying true to yourself and to your dreams. Sure. I mean, um, you know, the one thing I definitely am, am passionate about is I do think kids should play 
any sport they are passionate about, right? I, I do. I played football, basketball, and baseball. It was why I was a late bloomer to baseball. I didn't throw a pitch until I was 18 years old because I broke my leg playing basketball. So, you know, one of those really everything happens for a reason kind of thing. And I find myself walking on to AM and man, I'm green to pitching. I threw like 70 innings in high school. I don't know what I'm doing. And I just tell Rob Childress, like, man, teach me, show me the way, show me what I need to do. I had this big curveball, this funky slot over the top that I still have. And it's probably my biggest strength. And, you know, I, I was coachable and I listened and I just, uh, you know, kind of what you're asking. I knew that if I got bigger and stronger and just perfected my craft and listened to people that knew what they were doing as far as guys that were on the team that had some success, talking Brooks Raley, Clayton Ellert, Barrett Laux, um, and then obviously the good coaching that we had at a and I just got better as I logged reps. And, um, you know, it really is a cool story, man. Like a, a walk on to what you said, a two-time All-American, drafted as a junior, uh, similar to what Prager just did. You feel like you have unfinished business, so you come back for another year. Uh, we fell short in 2012, but still had another really fun run at Omaha and then um, get drafted to an awesome situation in L.A. And, and the rest is history, man. So here we are. What do you think you would have said had somebody told you, hey, you do this, you're going to be in the big leagues in 2024? Um, I would have said you're joking, man. <laughs> you know, I really wish I could uh, – you guys could, like, pull up a picture of what I looked like my freshman year in college. You know, I was probably – Six to 160 pounds, you know, just a total string being not strong. I was throwing probably 85, 86 miles an hour. But, um, you know, worked hard, man, and, and made that my dream and, and made that the uh, destination and, and worked as hard as I could to get there. And here I am at 34 years old, you know, 12, 13 years removed from Texas A&M even and still playing a kid's game for a living and just how special that is. So it's uh, yeah, I would have told that person. Uh, you're silly, but all the while working really hard behind the scenes to make it happen. Well, let me ask you about Ryan Prager because it's, it's such a similar story. Just uh, first off, what do you think it means for this team? And secondly, just you can you, you know exactly what he was going through, like trying to figure out to navigate what's the most important thing for his future. Yeah, man. Um, obviously, very excited to have him back. I was able to be around him and his family a little bit during the Stanford Regional uh, two seasons ago. And you can just tell he's a good kid, comes from a good family, and really passionate about baseball. Obviously, he was our Friday guy all year and, and um, you know, just was was so special for us. So to get that arm back along with all the bats that we got back is so huge, right? Because pitching still wins games. Uh, you can slug your way to Omaha. We kind of showed that. But at the end of the day, pitching, you got to have it. So to have a guy like that back is a huge deal. Uh, I'm sure that was a really tough decision. Uh, he turned down probably almost seven figures, if I were to guess. I think that was the slot value of that pick. I turned down much less than that. It was a pretty easier decision from a money standpoint. Um, you know, I, I do think the quicker you can get into pro ball, the better. So I, I know that was uh, probably a tough decision. Uh, as far as, you know, the next step for him in his baseball career. But to have him back in the maroon is is going to be huge. And you can tell we're going to be a powerhouse going into our next season. Yeah, and I and while I agree with you, I also think college baseball is in kind of a, a different place now, right? Because the the shortened draft. And you got some great players to st stick around for a little bit longer, especially because of the COVID year and whatnot. It's just a different college baseball, college athletics world that you played in. Well, it's so competitive, right? And then the NIL thing obviously throws a wrinkle into it. And some of these numbers start coming out and leaking of what these kids are going to getting to go to certain schools, A&M included. But the other thing I think you see is, for instance, we're playing the Angels right now. We got uh, uh, the shortstop Nito and the first baseman Shano. I'm not sure how you actually said they They were drafted in 2022. And Shano made the big leagues in 2023. And Nito has been in the big leagues all year this year. And we just called up our first rounder last year, a kid out of Grand Canyon named Jacob Wilson. So it, it's it, it's not unheard of now to move really quickly through the minor leagues. So when I say it is important to get into professional baseball as quickly as you can, maybe I'm a little off on that because I feel like teams, right, we've shrunk the minor leagues. There's not as many levels, not as many kids. So if you come in and you look ready and you're developing quickly, they'll move you as quick as you can. So, um, you know, maybe it makes sense to – stay in college baseball where it's so competitive and get into pro ball and, and move fast and find yourself in the big leagues within a year or two of getting drafted. Ross, I know you're obviously focused on your career, but the last 32 days have been ridiculous for Texas A&M athletics and, and baseball in particular. 
Take me through that kind of roller coaster ride from your perspective as you're watching games, you're seeing the news break, the ups and the downs, the lefts and the rights. Yeah, I'm in a fantasy football league with some of the players from my time. Uh, Daniel Mingdon, Ross Hales, Matt Yingo, Kenny Jackson, et cetera. So we were up on the season as much as we could be. Um, you know, really enjoyed it. I mean, that, that was the greatest season that a and baseball has ever had. So obviously we were watching and enjoying it. And, um, you know, just, I mean, we had three kids at like 25 homers or more, you know. So it just felt like we could beat anybody any night. And had just enough pitching to to keep us in it, and and you know we had Prager obviously, and then uh, the reliever that got drafted, I'm, I'm blank on his name, throwing 102 mile hour sinkers in college. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Chris you know? Cortez. So I'm we sorry, were, Chris Cortez. Cortez, Cortez. Yeah, we were watching, and you know, just takes us back to when we were making runs at Omaha, and just you know, knowing how special it was for those kids. And then to not be able to celebrate it, right, because of the madness that ensued over the next 36 hours after the, the you know, the, I guess, championship loss. And, uh, you know, without getting into it too much, I, I screamed it from the rooftops that Schlossnagel was never an Aggie. And I think he showed that at the end that that is more than enough to to make me happy, to be honest. His his uh, his reputation preceded him. And I'm just really happy now we got the guy that we want and he feels like he wants to be in Aggie land. He's an Aggie through and through. He's the one the players wanted. Um, I feel bad that they weren't able to celebrate such an awesome season. But then now, you know, a few weeks removed from that madness, it feels like we're just laser focused on Aggie baseball and the team that we have and the team that we're able to to put together and how excited everyone is for the next season. It's, it's a mile away, but we're already so excited for it, knowing the roster that we have and, and the head guy at early. Um for him to, you know, steer the ship in the right direction for us. Was that weird for you that being such a Rob guy um, and then a, a, a coach who had success against A&M takes over and has a lot of success, but then shows his true colors? Um, I'm not going to say it's weird. You know, I, I think obviously I'm a Rob Childress guy. He, I, The only reason I'm here is because of him and, and the uh, opportunity he gave me and, and, and the coaching that he instilled upon me. Um, you know, but I, I don't necessarily disagree that his era at Texas A&M came to an end. Uh, I hate that his last year was his worst year. And, and you know, this is a competitive league and and uh, expectations are really high. And they moved on. And, and honestly, Schloss Nagel's an amazing coach. We went to Omaha two out of three years. I just think when you're the coach at Texas A&M University, you got to buy into the stuff that we do, as weird as some of it is. And I always thought Schloss Nagel came across like he's too cool for it. And I feel like he really showed that at the end. So I, I love the idea of now getting early, a guy that the players really love. And he's going to have to learn how to balance that, right? There's a big difference between being the hitting coach and being everyone's buddy to being the guy that's taking and giving scholarships, taking and giving playing time, making the lineup every night. But he seems like he's got the character and the skill set for it. And, um, you know, I'm excited to haven't met him yet. I'm excited to be around the program this offseason and come check it out. But, um, no, I wouldn't say it was weird. I would just say uh, it was a three-year gap of going from a coach that I love to now a coach that I hope to love again. Yeah. Um, let, let's talk about early in a different way, too. The fact that the, the players love him give that – that hope of another run, right? Because every, not pretty much everybody's coming back, and they've added. So he's he's walking into a phenomenal situation. Yeah, you're spot on. I mean, it really couldn't be a better situation, right? You think of like the coach that inherited Ohio State after Urban Meyer left, or you know, it's a, it's that kind of metaphor where it's it's a juggernaut team where we're returning such an amazing lineup, including adding that kid from Texas Tech that was like second in the transfer portal. We somehow got a Prager back when he, you know, should be starting his, his you know, ascent to the major leagues. We got him back to pitch Fridays for us. And yeah, you can't inherit a better situation. So expectations are high, but that's part of it, man. You're in the SEC and you're playing and you're now coaching a team that uh, was runner up for national championship, so ex expectations should be high. And we're Aggies, you know. We always uh, we always expect big things, whether they happen for us or not. We we expect to be in the mix, especially on a national stage. And we have been in baseball for the last couple of years, and we expect to be moving forward. So you know, really couldn't be more excited for him and uh, this job that he has to undertake and and uh, see what he can do with it. So a new direction for Aggie baseball and a new direction for Aggie football. I know you like the football team. Just uh, some thoughts on what Coach Elko's been able to do. Yeah, man, awesome. Kind of uh, what we were just talking about, like just an Aggie, right? I love every time he speaks. I love that he flew to Omaha to support the the baseball team. You know, I love just kind of what you see from him as, as far as um, 
just being the head of a, a major football program and all that entails. And uh, I got to say, I hate that we're favored in every game. That just feels like it's just setting us up for disaster, right? But uh, it's it's a winnable schedule, a really good and winnable road schedule specifically, seems like. And, you know, we get Texas, which is the game I was raised on going to UT a and on Thanksgiving Day as a kid. So, you know, excited to see that game back. So it, it's, it, it can't get here soon enough, man. We're all fired up for the football season for sure. Ross, last thing for you. Growing up basically an Aggie, right? Going to the games, being around the culture with your with your family all having this Aggie history. Tell me your love for A&M, but also because you lived it, right? It's one thing to grow up in it, but then you also charted your own course. Yeah, exactly. Um you know the 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 coolest story, and I told this the other day on the on a podcast with Will Johnson. If anyone heard it, I was supposed to graduate the day of my last start at Olson Field. So you think of all these cool accolades that I've had through four years at A and M, and we're about to go into the playoffs, and I'm I'm supposed to walk the stage on Saturday. So I go to Coach Childress and I say, "Hey, my whole team. I'm sorry, my whole family's in town. Can I?" pitch on Friday so I can walk the stage Saturday. Me and Waka, Michael Waka flip. And he says, no, we're going into regionals. I got to keep you guys on schedule in the uh, order that you're in. So I'm like, man, that's a bummer. Like, I don't get to walk the stage. My whole family's coming in from all over the country. And instead, I actually throw a no hitter, my last regular season start in Olsen Field in front of 30 family members that were in town to watch me get my diploma. And you just kind of can't put a an exclamation mark on a career better than that, right? I mean, that was, that's so amazing to think of how many Aggies are in my family that were there to watch me graduate as an Aggie. Instead, got to watch me throw a no-hitter, my last regular season start. Um, you know, so it just, uh, I mean, I remember walking outside after that and multiple family members just have tears down their eyes. So it just kind of shows you how important Aggie Land is to the Stripling family and just how kind of cool of an experience and amazing of an experience really that I got to have being a part of that uh, community and and now moving forward forever as a member of the Hall of Fame. So just, um, yeah, you know, I said at the top of the show, it really couldn't mean more to me and my family. And I really couldn't be more proud of it uh, personally. To hear you say that story that I knew, it just, it's, it, it's, it's awesome. And if I remember correctly, it was San Diego State, right? It was, yeah, which is a total random game, right? Like it wasn't a bit, it was the last uh, series of the year, but it wasn't a big 12 series. It just, one of those, you know, perfect situations that just kind of fell into my hand, right? It's amazing. And to follow that up, I feel, and my memory is a little hazy, but wasn't your first start in the big leagues an almost no hitter? Like you went seven innings, basically. Yeah, I went. Uh, I went seven and a third, no hit in the rain as a Dodger in San Francisco. I walk Angel Pagan on my 100th pitch, and out comes Dave Roberts, who's getting booed yeah. for taking out a rookie in a visiting stadium um, because, you know, I was, yeah, five outs away from a no-hitter. And then, lo and behold, the guy they bring in gives up a, a home run. So, actually, uh, I go seven and a third, no-hit, one run in my Major League debut. So, yeah, kind of kind of crazy. Oh, man. Hey, Ross, I appreciate it. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. Thank you for making time. Congratulations on the haul and, uh, obviously, all your success there on the diamond. Yeah, thank you very much, man. Thanks for having me.